last but not the least our next speaker is api product manager at co-founder at apiable.io alat nap he'll be sharing his thoughts on what will be the next generation of api portals looks like hi welcome Alan. So, hi thanks a lot so yes. the uh, slides are uh whoops let's try that one more time great yes i can see your screen you're loud and clear go. i'll step back okay thanks hi guys yes yeah, so uh as you just said we're going to talk about the next generation of api portals uh today uh, i am alan Kanaba. I call myself an API product manager. That's what I've been doing the last few years. Uh, and I'm a co-founder of a company called API Able uh, or Apiable. Um, we create API portals as a service and help you put products on there. So a little bit about my, my background. I, I work mainly in, in larger enterprises. Had some good fun at BMW, more recently at Corner, uh, et cetera. So uh, I have quite a heavy enterprise background, but now I'm working in the startup world. So let's crack on then. We're, we're talking about API portals, right? Let's have a look at what we've got today, and then we'll move on to like how these things are going to look in the future. Um, what have we built so far? We've built predominantly developer portals. So a heavy focus on developers, developer documentation, developer communities, examples for the API code, et cetera. Um, sandboxes like we, we saw from uh, Faisal earlier, and we've run a lot of hackathons, right? So it's, it's very, very developer-centric. Um, and indeed, we're in the uh, developer experience channel here, right? So when we talk about connected developer experience, I would say that we're pretty much done, right? I mean, we can do incremental improvements, but we, we understand what developers want. Um, you can talk to Phil from Twilio. He's got a lot of experience about um, developers uh, and what they want and what they don't want you know we, we already kind of know this um and and we can apply it today the the problems occur with the current or the last generation of developer portals is that there's a lot of developers didn't come so we did the hackathons and we created great portals and apis and put them up on there but the developers just didn't come so if you already have a developer portal that's been running for a few years now uh, you will find um, more often than not um, that the adoption of the apis is quite low so developers don't come from external just sign up and start using your apis this is uh, this is one of the the biggest challenges that we've had uh, or if you're looking to build a new developer portal today, um, it's one of the things that you should have in mind is to ask the question, okay, why haven't the developers adopted the last generation of API portals? So I mean, there's a couple of immediate answers for this. One is that the DX is terrible. So you built a developer portal um, and you just didn't get it right. So developers come and they can't get immediate access to your APIs. They can't see examples, et cetera. And they're like, okay, this isn't for me. And, and they go elsewhere. Another reason is that developers are just not interested in your APIs, right? The APIs are just not targeted to, to developers is another reason. Um, but if developers aren't interested in your APIs, right? Who is? Who is interested in your APIs? We had this heavy developer, developer, developer focus though for the past 10 years on the API portals. And um, I think it's time to sort of move on a little bit and talk about the personas on these API portals that we have today, right? So, so this, is, this is a statement from Ash. Uh, and the two key words I wanna bring out here is customer and user, right? So customer is a decision maker that decides to use your product. Use your API effectively. Says, okay, we want to build this into our business and we want to be using your APIs, right? A user on the flip side is someone who is, is more or less told, okay, here's the software, go ahead and use it. A user may also be the customer, but in a lot of cases, especially when we're dealing with larger companies, um, the, the, the user is not the customer, right? And the same same vein, you can say that you know we have great user experience, um, we can have great developer experience, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the customer. 
And yes, again, I know I'm in the connected developer experience track here, but um, I'm going to go ahead and say that, that that customer persona is probably not the developer, right? This is um, probably someone else. Let me sort of go into a little bit more detail about what I mean there, because it's maybe not so clear, right? So if we have like APIs at product, which you should all be aware of by now, we can have products which are more developer focused and we can have products which are more business focused. So here I have on the left side, a developer persona on the right side, I call them a product manager. It could be, you know, business analyst, CEO, whomever. If we look at some of the um, products that you can launch to a developer, they expect immediate access to these things, right? Again, it, it's what Phil was talking about earlier with, you know, Twilio is that, it's a great developer experience because they can get in and immediately start using the stuff. With on the business side, however, it's quite often that businesses and partnerships, customers, they like to sign agreements before, right? So there's a waiting period. And the problem is that if a developer comes across one of your products which has this kind of uh, approval process first, where someone has to sign things and authorize, et cetera, that's a major turnoff for a developer. They'll just go away and, and won't come back again, right? So that's kind of one of the immediate differentiators between the two is, is what kind of level of access they can get. Let's look at some types of developer products, SMS. Yeah, they're writing an app. They need to send an SMS for every reason. They need to do some two-factor authentication, maybe some call forwarding, uh, connecting to Google Docs, uh, getting live cricket scores. That's actually one of the most popular APIs uh, out there. It's live cricket scores API. Um, but yeah, stuff that they can get to immediately and they can use them as utilities to build out their, their apps. Developers love that kind of stuff. If you've got that kind of, uh, those kind of APIs, you need to have a heavy developer focus. Uh, on the flip side, you know, my previous company I mentioned was Corner and they, may, they make elevators. Um, one of the things that is absolutely certain is that we would never give access to an elevator to a developer directly. There has to be this process in between where the building owner, the person who owns the elevator, gives approval for an organization to access the elevator programmatically, right? So it could be that they want to put a robot in to deliver pizza or whatever, right? But it's not just going to be that, you know, developer can build against it and, and, and start calling elevator. It has to be uh, partnering agreements beforehand. Same if, if for example, Telco um, offers possibility to create a mobile subscription. There's going to be organizations behind that. They've signed agreements to say, okay, uh, this is okay. If you're, for example, BMW and you have like the possibility to track a, a vehicle via an API, you're not just going to give that to a developer, right? It's too powerful. So you have to have these business agreements in the background. And these are more business products targeting business people. Uh, as well, you know, creating bank accounts, there has to be a lot of uh, legal stuff to jump through before you can do that kind of stuff. So some cheesy graphics to wake you up a little bit. Um, what we're talking about here, though, are products which are developer enabled. And I think this is where we've gotten a little bit confused, right? They're not, they're not products for developers, but they are products which are developer enabled. You must have a developer, or to put it another way, um, we can say just that developer. So, you know, if you have uh, some food here in the kitchen, you might see on the packet, just add water. Um, and in this case, it's just that a developer. So it's, it's, it's a product which you're targeting towards business people, but you still need to have that developer uh, in the mix. But it's also very important, what I'm not saying at this point is that you can completely ignore your developer, right? So we have um, a scenario where as a business person, you might go and uh, talk to one of your internal developers and say, hey, um, is this API any good? Yes or no? And if the developer comes back and says, well, the DX was terrible, I wouldn't use this, then, then you're not going to get the sale, right? So it still has to be trusted by developers. And everything you've learned today about DX is still 100% valid. I'm just saying that there's, there's multiple personas in this, right? So, so with that in mind, OK, how will the API portals of tomorrow look? OK, number one is make them consumable, right? So what we have today is a lot of very technical APIs 
that from a developer perspective, you can understand, uh, and we've done a great job on that. But if you're coming more from the, the business side of things, you're the product manager, um, maybe you don't have an IT background, maybe you're doing some like low code stuff, et cetera, but you, you just don't understand the technical part. We have to make our APIs more consumable. And the way we do that is we make them a product, right? So a product has a you know business plan behind it, uh, and it's all about consumability, making your APIs consumable. Um, to delve into that a little bit more, as I just said, okay, make sure your APIs are products and that they have a clear value proposition. That's, that's, that's effectively what we're saying. So anybody, developer, uh, you know, architect, product manager can come, look at the API and get an idea, okay, what's the value proposition for this? As I said before, they're consumable, monetizable, uh, and understandable by mere mortals. That's the, that's the key message I wanna get across, that your APIs are not just for technical people. If we talk about um, how do we present our APIs, we're, we're basically looking at um, developer experience on the, on the one hand. So as I said, I think we pretty much nailed that. So this is an extract from Stripe. So you can see Stripe has, I, I believe, you know, one of the most beautiful uh, developer documentations out there. It's very clear, it's lovely to understand, right? So that's what we've been doing until now. But what uh, Stripe also has, and not many people know about it, is they have like this digital marketplace as well, like an app store on the other side, which is then more consumable from like a you know, business perspective. So I can go here, I can see that they've productized uh, with their partners, a lot of different apps. So I can basically take these, it's like you know, a low code experience where I can kind of plug them in, et cetera. But the, the, the point is that there's dual experiences here. There's one for the customer, which is the decision maker, and one for the developer, and that's on Stripe. So if we look at this kind of like, as we just saw that sort of more of a digital marketplace feel versus a developer portal. If you're wondering, okay, when to use one over the other? Well, you know, it's pretty clear marketplaces when you are when you know that the decision maker for your product is non-technical, you need to wrap it in more of a marketplace style. Um, developer portal is clear, it can be very technical uh, decision maker. So if you have some, APIs, like I, I think like SMS is generally speaking quite quite technical uh, and they can make that decision. When you have API products, yep. So as I said, you know, you've gone heavily down that API uh, product route. You want to have it in a marketplace as opposed to, you know, just having very clear APIs, which are understandable immediately to develop. But they see your APIs and they go, oh, I get this. I understand what it does. Um, without having to read through all of the documentation. If you wish to monetize, then you need to be putting this stuff in a marketplace where you can subscribe to these uh, digital products. Um, if you can reach developers, then use a developer portal, right? So if you, if you already have a, a fantastic channel to thousands of developers, you have a great you know, developer community, which is thriving, et cetera, then go down the heavy developer route. Uh, if you want to introduce a subscription model, for example, um, we're talking about you know new ways of generating revenue, then use a digital marketplace. Uh, on the flip side, on the developer portal, um, it's very important that your APIs can be found, right? So that means that um, you know searching, search engine marketing, etc., so that developers can actually find your APIs and plug them into their apps. And then the question kind of arises, should we use both? Well, obviously the answer is yes. You can see that Stripe, um, one of the most successful API companies out there, uses both. They have both experiences. Um, so yeah, probably, but yes. Okay. So this is this is a screenshot from, from the old, um, demo portal we built last year at API Apple. And we can see that what we did was effectively say upon logging in, the user is asked to select, okay, their, their role, right? So customizable roles. And, and what we said is, okay, maybe we have a scenario where it's more of a business person. They don't wanna to see too much of the technical details. 
about the APIs. They want to see more like high level stuff. They're going to be putting their credit card in and they're like this business persona who will then you know disappear and not come back again at a later point. They invite their developers um, and the developer just wants to see great documentation, sandbox, try it out, all of the great stuff that we've heard about today. That's your you know connected developer experience. You may have you know uh, entrepreneurs, guys doing low code, etc., who will do a bit of development and also put their credit card in. That's more like you know a biz dev kind of scenario. So having this concept of multiple roles in your API portal uh, will will become more and more popular. KPIs will be baked in. KPIs for APIs, something that's that's coming up uh, in the last few few years is, you know, key thing is to prioritize your business goals, right? Don't get carried away with technical goals for your APIs and avoid vanity metrics. Vanity metrics means like you're tracking, I don't know, number of people uh, accessing the API or something like this. Only Only track those kind of vanity metrics if they're relevant to your business goals, right? So, so it could be, you know, you want to strategically lock your customers into your platform with your API. Um, or it could be that you're trying to generate new revenue from your customers, or you can be trying to grow the number of partners you get this year. Uh, these kind of things, they're the business goals you want to be tracking. And you want to be tracking them um, at the product level and your API um, supports them. Monetization, I really feel now we're trying to, we're getting to this point where we've kind of understood APIs and their relevance in the world, et cetera. And we're climbing this, uh, this slope of enlightenment as it were. Monetization is becoming more and more a thing. And as we say, we've got business goals for our products. We also can have a monetization case in there. I think until now, We've looked at the monetization part and said, well, we don't really understand how to do that, right? There's very few good examples of monetization, but as long as you've got like a business goal for your product, you can then say, okay, well, we understand how we want to monetize that then. If, if you say, okay, I want to earn 1 million in revenue from this product uh, next year, then you know you need to monetize, right? And, uh, and that's what we're going to see more of. So I'll just look um, then quickly at the um, future of how to build uh, one of these API portals. So it could be that you have a portal already, or it could be, looking, it could be that you're looking to create a new portal. So there's basically three options, right? First is off the shelf from the API management vendor. You already probably have some API management stuff in there. If it's like, you know, Apigee or Xway or Kong, uh, whatever, right? Um, so that's already installed and it comes with a developer pool of some kind. Um, you know, it doesn't require any additional integration because it's already integrated with your API management. And Enterprise Arctic love this, this idea of having, you know, everything from the same vendor that all connects nicely and is maintained together, right? Um, what, we've, what we've seen now with these developer portals is that a lot of them were created nearly 10 years ago and haven't really been upgraded. They're not very well loved. It's on like ancient technology like Drupal, for instance. Um, and it can be quite expensive as well. You sometimes need an external um, a separate license for the developer portals part that can start getting expensive. And also, you know, normally it's a skeleton. So you, you get like, if it were a car, you'd get like the wheels and the doors and everything, but it wouldn't have a, you know, maybe a steering wheel and the paint, right? You've still got to get this thing out to production and you've still got to maintain it yourself going forwards as well. You can request a custom portal from an external software agency. Um, a lot of people are doing this, you know, and the pro is, I mean, the major thing is you'll get exactly what you want, right? Your marketing and branding team will love you because it will be seamless. You'll navigate to your developer portal or your API portal, and it will look exactly like the rest of your website and be beautiful. Can get very expensive, right? So it's, it's normally an external agency. Unless you have a full DevOps team who can just build this thing for you, uh, even then it's going to be, uh, you know, a big project. Um, and of course, you have to maintain this thing going forward. So when the underlying API management system changes, you'll need someone who can tweak it and, and keep it uh, moving forwards. And as I said before, it needs a large project, substantial amount of time, time 
six months to a year, 100,000 plus to get that done. So SaaS-based uh, products, you know, everyone knows those have been around for a long time now. Uh, and this concept of, you know, having an API portal as a service. So you take like one off the shelf, um, standard like SaaS basis that you get continuous improvements, new features to it all of the time. Um, subscription based, so you don't have to invest like 100,000 up front. You pay a subscription and you get going on day one. And it's run as a service, so you don't have to worry about um, the underlying API management system changing because any changes there will be taken care of by the team. Uh, multiple API gateway support, meaning that we're not locked into any one vendor here. So um, it, it could be, for example, that you've got IBM and MuleSoft running at the same time in your organization from different lines of uh, business. Um, you can effectively connect both of those to, to one portal. Or alternatively, maybe you have an on-premise gateway and you also have something running in the cloud. No problem, you can connect the two together via the portal. Um, cons is, you know, it's hosted uh, off-premise. Um, in this case, you would need to ensure the user data is secure uh, and have a vendor who can do that. Uh, loss of control, someone else is running the system. And there are very few API portals as a service. So API-able, my company has an API portal as a service. I'll take you through that quickly. So this is what we call the next generation API portal. And this is the kind of things you want to see in there. So we have the demo available. This is the old demo. We're already uh, implementing a production version now with our pilot customers. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a second. The technology agnostic, like I said before, you should be able to throw whatever uh, gateway is behind it, no problem. Uh, we have adapters that can connect to pretty much all of these guys uh, and use them. Uh, identity provider integration, if you already have developers and they're authenticated with your, within your own you know, SSO, that's no problem. Roles, as we said before, having this concept of different roles, business, developer, et cetera, and the marketplace concept. So you can subscribe to API, just making it a little bit more brain friendly at the end of the day. Coming June, 2021, um, like I said, we're implementing now for our first set of pilot customers. Um, when that's out the door, then we have capacity to take on that new customer. So if you're interested, then uh, drop us a line. Like I said, uh, we are API able. That's here, API able.io. Uh, that's how, the, how you find us for the website. You can book a demo. I'll throw some more demo slots in the evening uh, for you guys so that you can actually get a hold of me. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Feel free to to reach out on uh, you know LinkedIn, especially. I'm quite active under the name Alan Knabe. I'll pop this in the chat as well, so you can see it. Okay, so. Hey, Alan. Hi. Yeah, nice Hi, to know about the future. How, how does the future of API portal look like? So, uh, just wanted to know, uh, as in, uh, how do uh, how do industries differ in terms of an API portal adoption? Old or new, futuristic or uh, legacy types, but still, which have yeah. So industries, right? So I mean, I, I think one of the most active industries right now, you know, if you look at the banking industry, not because they wanted to do it, but because they were forced to do it with all of the open banking regulations, right? Um, but but there as well, we, what we saw in the first wave was that they they conformed and they made open APIs and a, a good developer experience. And, and some of them have looked at that and said, well, you know, we invested so much money in it. Can we get some kind of return on investment? So there's the regulation part. And then and now they're looking at them and saying, OK, well, we've got a whole team running these APIs. Is it just, you know, a cost burden or can we actually you know, monetize, productize some of this stuff and actually, you know, do cool things with it. So I think in per industry banking is really uh, fintech, something that's sort of leading at the moment. Um, but, you know, APIs are across every industry. And, you know, even like, you know, elevator companies like Kona are, are you know, now starting with their API program and have some really cool APIs where you can do things like, 
uh, do pizza delivery through the elevator is my favorite example, right? So, so you know, have a robot deliver room service in a hotel and and access the elevators, etc. So, some really cool stuff coming out there. Yeah. Okay, great. And in terms of features in the portal, um, is uh, the uh, virtualization and uh, showing a flow of at least one API is that a desirable feature, or are your companies more adopting that? I've seen something in uh, DBS where you can see the um, check. They have the uh, portals for uh, they have the APIs for the loan uh, mortgage actually application mm -hmm. and all. So they can check the eligibility. So they have given a full workflow with the dummy screens actually. So is it something yeah. is adopted? Uh, how do you I see it? I, I, I like the idea. I've seen it a little bit as well. I think it makes it quite brain friendly for the developer. Um, I, I, I think you definitely have to include in that the business persona, like I was saying. I think the person we'll see over the next year is coming to these API portals and adopting these APIs will be these business people. And I, if it's not too technical, then I think that that kind of works, right? If, if, if you're giving uh, everybody an idea for how the APIs work and the value they provide, right? And I also think, you know, we should do a lot more um, like videos. So, you know, product videos, put them up on the portal so people can see, okay, uh, you know, in 60 seconds, okay, what this product does. Um, so even the developer can, you know, benefit from this because they, they then get a, a much better overview about what this product does. What we do today is we throw, you know, 50 APIs uh, with great documentation, but one after another, and a developer right. has to kind of sort through and work out, okay, which part of it do I actually need to implement? And how does that part work? And, you know, do I need the other API to call? But no, we package them now into products which do one thing. And, and it includes like, you know, one or two APIs with resources. And it's very clear also for the developer what the value proposition is. So that when they're developing, they, they know what they're doing. Right. Great. Uh, thanks, Ellen. Uh, don't have any further questions. All right. Yes. Thanks. I'll go and uh, tend to my fire, which has gone out in the meantime. <laughs> but uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the uh, the conference. I think it's the, the last bit now, yeah?